Thank you. Thank you so much, you know, for uh, coming out today. And, you know, promise made, promise kept. Uh, you know, after uh, we witnessed uh, the shooting of uh, Catherine, um, after I spoke with the mother and saw some of you on the street that night, uh, thanks to those of you who came up. I st stated that we were going to come and just sit down and have one of many conversations. This is not the only conversation. And just hearing your ideas from the ground as we start this administration. You know, it's sort of it's hard to believe, but it's only been three weeks. Mm. You know, and it has been nonstop since then. Uh, but I, I want you to know uh, in a very clear way that I am more energized i'm not tired i'm not stressed out um, i'm not i'm not trying to figure out can we get through i'm not fighting for a victory i'm fighting from a place of victory and part of that comes from you know, during the time of being in the state senate as well president and uh throughout those years i came across all of you on the street we would stop we would talk we would be out as shooting responses uh, we, I just saw what you did on the ground, and I just took notes in my book, in my journal, and said, you know what, when we get the helm, we can do this the right way. But doing something the right way starts with communicating with people who are on the ground. You know, I don't want to go in and attempt to dictate to you when you are on the ground. I want to hear your ideas. And what we need to be doing as we evolve into the next level of uh, the on the ground fighting crisis management of uh, you know all the different groups and organizations that are doing this uh, I want to hear from you as we build out the program and come with some some uh, not so standard that is not unique to the particular areas uh, but to really have an understanding you know and I just saw Sheena Sheena what are you doing all the way over there come on come on this is my deputy mayor strategic Sheena. partnership <laughs> You know, uh, 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 so, you know, she's the one that's going to create all these partnerships. So you got to grab a chair yeah, right there. And, 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 and sit here. So we want to spend the bulk of our time hearing from you uh, and your thoughts uh, as we arm ourselves up uh, for this, you know, this the next couple of years. Uh, but, you know, just being uh, present and um, what we're doing. So I just wanted to, you know, just give my colleagues that are here a, a few comments, and then we're going to turn it over to you. Just give me your your uh, your insight, you know. Go down the line. Go ahead, Senator. And we just all the way through. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, for, for calling us today. I'll be very brief. Uh, as I said yesterday, the, the vigil for, uh, for our, that 11-month-old, uh, first, we have to support families and communities who are going through this crisis. Second, we have to think about accountability for the folks who have done wrong. But third, we have to ask ourselves the tough questions of how we truly create safe communities, how we create communities that are thriving, that are stable, where this type of thing <clears throat> does not happen. And those are the tough questions. And that's why you're all here. We thank you for being here, and I'm glad for the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for being out here today. Thank you, Mayor. We were uh, here yesterday uh, for the vigil for the young girl uh, that got shot, and then the mayor and I uh, met at Harlem Hospital uh, to be with the families of Officer Rivera and Mora. And prior to that, we have been also with the, uh, in East Harlem where the young woman uh, that worked at Burger King got shot and killed. Even though she gave her money back to mm. the guy, the mm. armed robber, she they just went ahead and shot and killed her anyway. All in my district. So this is a crisis, right? Uh, far too much in a short period of time. And you are sort of like the folks on the ground that could be very helpful. We want to hear from you. And also, you know, I'm an advocate that that uh, we work with the mayor to see also how we could uh, implement more effective law enforcement practices so that we could. I come from Washington Heights. 
in the 80s and 90s. I don't need to tell you what went on there. <clears throat> I see far too m many elements of what I saw mm, back in the day mm. over there. Here. In fact, it reminds me of that. I told the mayor yesterday that we need to work together to dismantle that. Yes. Peace and blessings, everyone. Thank you so much to Mayor Adams for once again coming to the Bronx and to all of my colleagues in government who are here and really all of you, our credible messengers on the ground that every single day are doing God's work. You already know I see you. We've had a great partnership during my time in the city council. I am no stranger to being in the streets with all of you. And so we're going to continue to do work. And I think if there's ever been a reminder of the importance of our work, all we have to do is look at the first three weeks of this year under the leadership of this new administration, our mayor and myself as your borough president. I never thought I was ex would experience the first three weeks as we have done. But we are ready, willing, and able to do the work. We've responded. And, and certainly, whether it's the horrific fire in Twin Parks, the building explosion in Longwood, the police officer shot in Belmont, uh, to the shootings we've had in the middle of all of this, there was someone fatally shot early this morning down in the South Bronx. And so it's happening every single day. And I want to continue to uplift all of you and give you the power that you need. You are out there literally putting your lives on the line to save our young people and give them a real chance at a future. And we elected officials have to do more to support you. And so I thank you for being with us uh, this past week. But I thank you for all the work you've done over the years. The crisis management system is a system that I believe in and during my time with the council supported you as the chair of the Committee on Public Safety and certainly I know your work. I know your heart. I know your mission, your commitment and the investments you've made. And so today is a real opportunity to talk and strategize and plan because if we don't plan then we fail to plan and we plan to fail. And the reality is, is we need a plan. We cannot continue to gather at vigils and all sorts of events where we're mourning the lives of someone lost, someone in the hospital. It's just unacceptable. And I want to thank our mayor and certainly ask all of you to continue to pray for the officer, Officer Rivera, who put his life on the line and his partner who's fighting for his life. And just pray for everybody because there's a lot of people out in our city, in our borough that are hurting. But I look forward to working with you. And you already know, if I need to be there, I will be there with you, boots on the ground. We are here to get stuff done. We are not playing. Time is of the essence. And I thank you all for your incredible work. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. And thank you so much, Mayor Adams, for organizing this. I'm Council Member Oswald Feliz. I'm the proud council member of this district. I'm also a proud resident of this neighborhood. I grew up and I've lived here my entire life. And I'm also a proud graduate of this school, PS46. <laughs> this is a school that I attended about 20 years ago. And as a lifelong Bronx resident, but also resident of this neighborhood, I can tell you there's a lot of pain. Families growing up here are consistently asking themselves one question, whether they'll ever see safe neighborhoods mm. or whether what it's going to take for them to see neighborhood, a safe neighborhood is to move, uh, move out of the neighborhood that they're currently living at. That's horrible. That's beyond horrible. But I want to thank all of you uh, for working around the clock, risking your lives, door knocking, and intervening, and doing everything possible to interrupt violence before it happens. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work with all of you and also all my partners in government, uh, city, state, and federal elected leaders. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going we're to open the floor. But, you know, someone always say, ask, well, if the uh, crisis management or, you know, the credible messengers, if they're in a the borough, why do we have a shooting? And I keep telling them, you looking at the shooting that happened, look at the ones that did not happen That's right. because you were there. Right. You know, so we, 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 we talk about how many runs a batter knock in. We don't say how many runs are saved by the shortstop, you know. And so I know that, you know, you're stopping a whole lot of beefs and battles and retaliatory shootings. Uh, I'm aware of that. And, you know, uh, so don't, don't listen to the noise. Stay, let's stay focused and not get distracted. You know, so why don't we open the floor? Based on your observation of doing this work, what are some of the things that you believe could be done better? Uh, 
you know, what are your, your, your thoughts? And so this is just a, a conversation. We're going to have a larger conversation citywide and bring all of the teams in. But we specifically wanted to come to the Bronx. The Bronx is dealing with a lot of shootings lately, uh, and we wanted to come here. And that's why uh, we held this just with, um, with Bronx for the most part. Uh, I know that we sent out a citywide uh, in era, but it was really, this was Bronx focus. That's, that was our focus. But we will be doing a citywide larger event with all of uh, the groups and organizations. But we really wanted to be thoughtful on the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So we'll open it up. <coughs> Let's start with S SOS. All right. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Peace and blessings to everyone. Um, and thank you for all the elected officials for saying such kind words and truly believing in this work. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, congratulations again, and definitely have been seeing a lot of your energy, so definitely want to throw back more, and you know, a lot of positive energy your way because it's a very busy time. Um, definitely seeing the borough president out every day, boots on the ground. Um, Haley Nolasco, Director of Community-Based Violence Prevention at the Center for Court Innovation. So I'm here representing both SOS and the RISE Project. The RISE Project is the domestic violence arm of the city, um, the CMS network. So also wanted to let you all know about that project since what happened, the tragic incident last night was actually a domestic violence dispute and we do cover that area, so wanted to also share that as well. Um, briefly, and I don't know if this is part of this conversation, maybe it'll come up uh, a little later on, but one of the things that I'm seeing that I think could be beneficial to this is that everybody's been working really hard. Um, and I think because of a lot of the work that has been happening, the testament to that work has been the, um, the addition of resources to the crisis management system. Um, and I know the MACJ has been working extremely hard to get all those resources to the groups as soon as possible so that we're able to increase capacity and really, you know, expand and work in those areas that we're so desperately needed in. But uh, sometimes, and also having worked in the previous administration as well, understanding that sometimes there is some red tape that exists. So sometimes the need doesn't always match the getting the funds to the organization so that they're able to hire as quickly as, you know, it's needed. So it's like, you need to hire, and, you know, something happens, like, where are the people? And she's like, oh, we need to hire. So <laughs> um, helping and supporting, um, because especially when, um, Mark Jay is really working really closely with the groups to support them. Sometimes it, things may get held up in like contracts and things like that. So, for example, with the um, previous, um, the recent amendments that, um, that are helping to increase capacity, there's been a little bit of a hold up contracts wise. So I think that once a little bit of that red tape gets removed, a lot of these organizations would be able to staff more expeditiously to have those boots, those additional boots on the ground. So I think that's one thing, um, because all of the groups citywide, and you know, they've all been working extremely hard to really like, just, I don't want to say chase fires, but there's just so much that's been happening. So I think that that's one thing that the work is happening, it's working, but to really be able to match the need, I think that that little piece could be super helpful. So, that's just so, we, so we should, uh... Uh, you know, we should identify what's the bottleneck, and if you could help us understand what's the bottleneck. Uh, you know, bureaucracy gets in the way, um, and you know, these cities are so dysfunctional, and it should not, if you are, if you, number one, if you already had a contract, and you're just renewing it, you should not be starting from scratch. I don't know if that's what's happening. I don't know if you're deal, dealing with more paperwork. We want to move to a place that we're using technology better. And, you know, f uh, filling out, we hear this all the time, filling out, you know, thousands of documents to get a $5,000 grant just makes no sense, you know. So we want to figure out how do we streamline this and at the same time protect taxpayers' money. You know, we don't want to be reckless with our action. Mm -hmm. So we should get some ideas from you based on your observation on how do we streamline the process. Mm -hmm. Happy Saturday, all. Jessica Mofield, uh, Executive Director of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence at Mock Day. Thank you for creating the space uh, to not only hear and amplify the voices of the individuals of this room, but also the collective. I can speak a little bit more explicitly to the issues of procurement that Haley is referencing. This is a structural issue that we've been experiencing in the city where the heart and spirit of the organizations are not always matched by the city's policies and procedures around how access to capital gets to community members. I think a lot of times, based on the structure of it being reimbursable, there's the assumption that there's access to cash flow already. So the work already happens and then people are reimbursed. So I think where the red tape lies is policy around changing contracts from being reimbursable 
to supporting whether it's by performance base or by line item, where we're actually able to get money to community at the same cadence of the expectations that we have for their performance on the ground. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's explicitly important. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we see in this space, especially when we talk about the exhaustion um, and the trauma of constantly having to come out and convene around vigils, around babies being hurt, around individuals not being able to come home, I think it also speaks to other system actors that are not in this space today. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of this is around not only access to capital, but access to housing and how people are able to remove themselves out of communities in different spaces, not necessarily completely out of the borough, but in other neighborhoods where they can establish a perception and a sense of safety at the ability of being able to move, even though they might not have the financial capacity to be able to move themselves. Mm -hmm. So if we had the ability, um, to connect with the HPD and challenge the policy of not only having special grants to be for five families per year, mm -hmm. where there was actually a set aside for victims of gun violence, I think that would allow the narrative to change around black boys and girls not being seen as victims so that their families can actually get the support to be survivors. Um, I think that's the kind of policy and narrative change and shift that needs to happen in addition to the support around how we actually view the contracts, who's receiving the contracts, and how that money is distributed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw RPG in the house somewhere. RPG released the grip. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful day. Release the grip. Thank you. Pull, pull the microphone a little closer to me. Thank you. God bless you all this morning and the same hearty greetings that all extended to you, Mayor Adams. We extend to you as well. Obviously, all of you here want to give special attention to Borough President um, Vanessa Gibbs, Gibson, as well as the um, council member for the Release the Grip 2 site, northern site that we work in. I do want to note um, a few things. Quite oftentimes when uh, folks speak to our work or what we do, and it, it really is, speaks to what you said concerning, oh, what are they doing? You know, well, the police force is a big force, and I don't speak against it. My dad was a police, and I'm a proud New York City um, Harlem girl. And so our sites are generally between boots on the ground, between about 5 to 12 people, right? And we cover approximately 10-ish blocks. And so um, we're not around the clock. So it's a misnomer when people think that um, something should have been done quickly. So just for the sake of clarity, I think it's important to note that, right? That we are not um, this large group with 20 people on the ground to cover about 10 blocks. And yes, we've extended ourselves. I think it's important to also note that there is much being done right, to keep this moving. Number one, to engage young people during the day. Many of our office spaces are not that big. It's really challenging to get, if our office was this big, we, you know, like we'd be jamming, right? But you're trying to piece together. So there's the work that's being done on the ground by the violence interrupters, uh, accruing information, building relationships, you have young people who are really are wanting to get out, right? Whatever that means for them. Um, but over the last, I want to say, when did we do that when we took those young people away? Almost two years ago, there was, 2019, there was a conflict in the Belmont area between two groups. And there were shootings during the day, a real wild, wild west scenario. And uh, we were able to take them to a location that we had purchased before we used it for something else to get them off the ground. And it was so important to get them out the city, but part of the conversation is, if we stand down, what if they don't stand down? So trying to balance this, trying to bring key players together, and yes, the structure has been changed. And I believe over about the last two years, you have structures. and. And right now, yeah, I'm talking about gangs, but that's not the only thing. There's mental health, right, issues. There's desperations. But then you're talking about there's been a change in the structure, 
right? And so entities have come together. And so it changes the dynamics of what's going on on the ground and who is merged together and now who they're standing against. So yes, it is when funds get to us, it is making it very clear about how many people we have on the ground. Because when we say on the ground, that includes our outreach workers who do risk reduction work. Lightly, um, some case management, because you have to get people ID cards, right? You have to spend time speaking to them. You have to get birth certificates. You have to bring them through some, um, some courses in um, job readiness so that you can move them on to a, to a class. And some here know what I'm talking about, and I believe some of the older um, cure violence crisis management teams have, are doing it better because of years. Some folks just need to get out the city. We've sought to relocate about two of our, um, two of our participants, I was gonna say two of our kids, right? Two of our participants, because they just need to be out the city, right? Because they're desperate. We won't even address housing. But this work is a lot bigger than just people on the ground, because if that was the case, with all due respect, no shade to anyone, the police would have already d done it. So it's not just put people on the ground because they do have guns. We don't have guns. We are definitely using relationships. And we have all seen, right, teams get guns out of people's hands. We've had a call, and I'm going to stand down, where one of our kids said, yo, meet me at this such, to an outreach worker, to his case manager. He couldn't get there. He sent somebody else on the team. The young kid thought that, our outreach worker was going to put work in with him. And he literally talked them down and saved somebody's life that, la that night. So there is lots of work and kudos and love and great respect to everybody who's doing the work, especially those who are around this table and in the city who's doing this work without a grant and with a grant. Bless you all. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's, it's not every day that we get the opportunity, right, to have the, to have the mayor here paying full attention. Obviously, he's, he's going to have the energy to do this a lot. But let, we, let, I want to actually throw the question perhaps to, to the folks at Bragg, who obviously I know very well because we do a lot of work together. There's obviously micro and macro questions that we need to ask. Mm -hmm. The micro and the short term and the immediate is obviously we're all figuring out how we actually deal with the crisis at this moment which is obviously there's something happening, and that can't be denied. So the micro and the more immediate uh, are, are things that, that, that obviously emotion is going to drive a lot of that. Right? The questions I want to ask about, uh, and, and I want to throw it obviously to Bragg, but to everybody, are the more macro questions about more long-term. Right? If we don't have a long-term conversation about why these things happen to begin with, then they're going to happen again. And so the... I want us to make sure that we keep that, you know, kind of, we have the 100 foot view right now because obviously everything is very raw because it's just happened and I'm not going to take anything away from the people that feel that passionately because it's obvious. I mean, you have a kid getting shot, a, a police officer getting killed. This is not a small thing and it's not a, a something to be dismissed. I'm not being dismissive of that. Mm -hmm. But we also have to take the 1,000 foot view as policymakers. And you folks, as the folks on the ground, that's what I want to throw to you. Tell us a little bit about micro and macro and how we can think about that. First and foremost, thank you for having me. Thank you for everybody coming. Um, like my area of concern right now, the problem that we're having with Bragg expansion is right now we cover from Fordham to Kingsbridge. So we took St. James Park when we first got St. James Park. There was multiple crews there, multiple. We was able to come to an agreement where one crew had to deploy. It's not gonna work out. It worked out. To this day, we have over 1,300 days in my catchment without a shooting, mm. without a homicide, right? So now they talk an expansion. We already laid it down where we know as, as we capture these catchment areas, and like they said, violence is a disease. We're pushing the virus out. 
So now if we're asking about a certain area to capture, but we're getting issues on it because as you can see this area, the shooting happened on 198 and Valentine. We understand that. But as you know, Valentine Avenue is drug infested. And now it seems like they want us to move this way. We don't have a problem with that. But we're the ones on the ground. We know where the shooters are coming from. So one of my areas of concern is we understand we're not drug counselors. We stop violence. That's our number one key. We know the drugs bring the violence. But if we're stating that the violence is on the other side and we're asking to move up because we have Morris and Crescent, so we know the different crews over there. And right now, it seems that if we would already had that, we would have been already able to mobilize a team right away because we're on that side. We know the credible messages, the, those that are suitable. But you could be credible, but are you suitable? And that's the biggest thing here. We know a lot of credible people, but not everybody that's credible is suitable to do this work. So uh, we're, we're, we're like kind of like stuck. I don't know how long ago was the expansion already, but we already have people on reserve. And this is how we like, this is how we work. We have volunteers. We use our volunteers. They're next up. We know people need jobs and all that. And then the vaccination issue came. A lot of people didn't believe in that. So that kind of like put us in a place where some organizations are asking or all, all employees have to be vaccinated. That became, that kind of like came to a standstill because I can't force anybody. We can't force anybody to go ahead and take this vaccination. If that's their belief, but we do know that these people can do the work. So and my Eric, that's, that's the biggest Eric concern I have is that we have to look at the shootings, where the crews are at. And I just feel like as brag organization, it's, it's not letting us completely keep pushing this, this, this virus, this disease, this gun violence way out. So we already cleared one area. And I'm asking that, you know, I know my Jay's in, in, in charge of the situation and all that. And my other area of concern, not to go off of Gustavo, but I-95. I-95 runs through the Bronx. New York has never been known to manufacture guns. These guns are coming through I-95. Are there any strategies to create a state or federal task force or something that is going to stop? Because we hear thousands of guns are getting confiscated, but thousands of guns are still out there. And it's a beautiful thing. We're capturing a lot of guns, but as you see, if there's a shooting every day, sometimes twice, three times a day, and we're in the heart of I-95, or... Is New York planning to, like, at least, you know, reach out to other states, tighten up the laws on getting these guns? Because they're flooding only our communities. You know, I lived upstate before, and you don't, you don't see that. And if there's guns out there, these are people that are registered or whatever it is, but to flood our streets. And I'm asking because also, you know, it's so much on my mind, but also I hear that there's creating task forces, you know, they're going to have the under, unmarked cars again and everything. And my concern with that is we have a lot of people carrying in the street. We have a lot of people that carry that have problems on these streets. They have beefs. They, they're so-called ops. And now, is there any other... I, I want to know if there's more strategies on working with are these cops being trained on how to approach individuals or were they just jumping out? And these cops are young, 19, 18, 20 years old. As you can see, the two officers that were shot and the one that fatally died, you know, 19, 20, 22 years old. And I know as a young kid, if I'm in the street and I'm carrying a guy just jumps out of a car knowing that I have a lot of issues in the area, the first thing, what you think the first thing that young man is going to do, he's going to reach. He don't know where it's coming from. So I have a big concern with that. And that's something that needs to be talked about. You know, we go through trainings for approaches, for pitches, to talk to our individuals. Is there anything in play for the officers to do this, to learn on how to approach? And we did a training a while ago for the 46th Precinct, a three-day training. 
and I role played, and their approach was, I mean, I, I stopped them in their tracks with the approach, like things that I said as thinking if I would if I was this young man, and some of these officers just didn't know what to do. So when you don't know what to do, the first thing you might do is just only thing you know how to do is reach, and that's where our problem is at too. So I'm 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 asking and I'm suggesting is there any strategies for that mayor because. So, uh, so two things to answer uh, both parts. Uh, one, the flow of guns. And we have been uh, communicating with the uh, president who, you know, to uh, uh, my uh, optimism, uh, he gets it. He understands that this can't be a, you know, just a local problem. Because you're right, we're taking thousands of guns off the streets and thousands are flowing back in the street. So we we never solve this problem right. if it's just uh, getting it from, you know, the end and not the source. And that's our focus. That's one of our plans. We, we, we're really fortunate with Congressman Espriot and what he's doing with the New York delegation. And you're going to see there's a real comprehensive plan that we're going to be rolling out uh, with the uh, president, the federal, the state, the city government all coming on board to do information sharing and going to the source. Because just as there's just a small number of shooters, there's a small number of gun dealers that are supplying the large number of guns in our city. We have to zero in on them and use our, everything in our arsenal. Uh, Senator uh, uh, Myrie produced a bill where we could sue those gun manufacturers. But we also want to target them and bring them up on criminal charges in cases where it's fitting as well. So there's a comprehensive plan because you're dead on uh, you know, there's, you know, there's no gun plants in the South Bronx, and we're clear on that. The second is the, uh, the plainclothes aspect of it, and, uh, you know, we, we welcome uh, any uh, training methods that you have identified based on your skill, because the, the sterilized training methods that are being used, that's being used year after year after year, did not change with, you know, what happens on the streets. And so um, having, you know, the team of you come in, speak to those new officers that are going in my version of a, a gun unit is different from what you, what you saw in the past. Because the number th one thing I heard during my years of fighting against police abuse, I was up here when Diallo was shot. You know, uh, his mother is a friend. And, um, and Baez and Zongo and all of these other families uh, you know, I know them personally, and this is what I put my life on during 100 Blacks and Law Enforcement Who Care. But policing is both omnipresence, the blue and white, and it's also unpredictable. If all you had is blue and white vehicles out there, the bad guys are going to have one jump on you. That's just the reality of public safety. They need to feel that they don't know when there's an officer around, but it has to be done right. And the number one complaint I receive is that, as you said, cats were just jumping out on you, you know. So our version is not going to be that version. And we're going to, when we roll it out, we're going to let you see exactly what we're doing. And it's going to be a successful way of going after guns without creating that ism. Because we're not going backwards. We're not going back to the days where everyone that walked the streets was stopped, searched, frisked, harassed. We're not going back to those days. We're going to be extremely pr precise on who we're zeroing in on, because you know what, we know the shooters. We know who's carrying, we know, you know where the problems are. You don't have to throw out a blanket on the entire community. You could pinpoint exactly where the shooters are, the known shooters, and how to ap approach them. But just as we're gonna do precision policing, we're gonna do precision resources. Because we know who's on the pathway to get into violence, so why not catch them before they get into violence and give them the resources they deserve? So I would love for you uh, to sit down with um, Phil Banks, my uh, Deputy Mayor of Public Safety, and go through the training that you're talking about. And if we have to modify our training, we look forward to doing so. Hey, I just wanted to touch a little bit on the, when we were discussing macro and long term, um, a bit, so, and Jessica touched on this too, when we're talking about gun violence, it's a structural issue, right? So by the time that trigger was pulled, 
that gun violence happened way before that moment, right? So whether it's my schools are under-resourced, I'm having domestic violence happening in the home, when I go to the hospital, my services are inadequate, when I try to get food, like, that's also inadequate. And I think that even with the pandemic, um, it, and we could all agree that that, once that happened, a lot of that was exposed even further, right? All these systemic issues that we're having. So I think that if we're looking at this from a macro level, we really need to keep the button, like when we're talking about precision resources, Mr. Mayor, also making sure that we're keeping our finger on that button to, to like continue to pour into that. And like, so for two examples specific to the crisis management system, when we're talking about like school conflict mediation and youth enrichment services, I think a lot of supports could come from the administration on allowing the credible, message to, the credible messengers to be able to do their work in the schools. Are there some schools that completely buy into the model and they have a good time and it's productive? Sure, but there are also schools where that's a little bit more tougher. So I think having a little bit more support from the administration to allow the DOE to really continue to believe in this and bolster this work within the schools would be super important because we know a lot of what happens in the community goes into the schools and vice versa. So I think long-term and expansion, and I, and I don't know these, um, I know these conversations are already happening, so I don't want to say that they're not, they are, but I just want to make sure that we're keeping the, our finger on that button um, because the schools are super important. It's vice versa in there. So really getting that support from the administration to really push on DOE to have them respect this work, allow this work to happen, and really um, have a real conversation about what's working, how is it working. Even before ever working at the administration, I worked at two um, care violence sites, and I've seen it. You know, I've seen it work, but I've also seen those conversations of like, well, I'm not sure what's going on here. But I've I've seen when a school buys into it, they identify those young people that are giving the most trouble. They put them in a room together and they build. And when that's happened, we've seen a lot of success. Secondly, also bringing in a little bit of the um, DV or even general interpersonal violence stuff. Um, having some of that in the schools in an intentional way with credible messengers could be super helpful. So I know we're starting that, um, actually in Brooklyn, we're starting that a little bit more in the Flatbush area where we're having rise go into the schools and talk to people generally about how do you have a healthy relationship? Because I think when you have, know how to have a healthy relationship, it goes into your intimate relationships. It also goes into friends and family. And when we know how to care about each other and respect each other and talk, to, talk about our, emotion, our emotions in a way that's um, productive and meaningful, there can be a lot that can happen there. So just thinking about that, you know, like on a, on a macro level in that conversation, that's what well, came we, to mind. We, we, we believe, uh, you know, those who have heard me say it over and over again, it's about building an emotional intelligence. You know, uh, how do we communicate and how we identify our emotion and uh, the emotion of, of others. And we're fortunate, uh, you know, I picked an amazing chancellor. And, you know, we're looking at as we, because we, we have to deal with intervention and prevention. We got to always keep that in mind. You know, while we are building up those things that have a holistic approach and we take down those intervention, you, you can't move away intervention and all of a sudden, you know, say that, hey, things are going to turn out well because, you know, shootings are going on now. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do, we see even the decrease in school safety agents while we increase crisis management inside our schools. Mm -hmm. That's part of our plan. Mm -hmm. We're not moving our school safety agents mm -hmm. overnight, but we see that we can start um, changing the flow of things. And then I'm going to allow my school safety agents to be promoted into the police department after two years of exemplary service you know, so as we making these transitions, because a lot of people don't realize the overwhelming number of school safety agents are black and brown women. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing, their relationship with these children are remarkable. You know, they, you know, they are seeing these children who are having problems with clothing, bringing them clothing to school, food to school, talking to them, having, being these surrogate parents. And I think after having two years of doing that in the school system, you ready to go to the NYPD, <laughs> you know, but... We've closed that door, and I want to change that. So I, I want the presence of my crisis management team um, dealing with conflict resolutions, uh, interacting with these young people. But we have to do it. We're, we're not just trying to turn this over overnight. Within one or two-year period, I would love to see a greater presence mm -hmm. because you're doing more than providing a safe environment. You start to nurture in these young people who really may not have of that that model at home and so i'm with you and and uh chancellor banks is all in we just had a meeting at frederick frederick douglas academy which the chancellor was leading with a group of black men 
and uh, and their organization. So you're singing our song. We're all, we're all, all in. You want to say something, Congressman? Yeah, uh, two things. Um, first, on the funding, right? Microphone. Oh. The funding. Yeah, I, I understand that uh, the way the city work, um, it's sort of like not advantageous. So it does, it's not friendly to organizations like many of the organizations that you run. Because they want, they want you to be reimbursed after you provide the services. And you don't have hundreds of millions of dollars. So that formula lends itself to like the big institutions yeah. like Columbia University, the people that have the consultants and the grant writers and the uh, you know, certified public accountants and the lawyers. But you know, those organizations, those institutions don't have the grassroots Right. connections that you have right. but the system itself of the funding RFP system is not friendly to you so that's something that has to be re right. re looked at right? right there has to be a deep dive there to see how these organizations could work with with the grant that they get and they don't have to sort of like put out the service before they get reimbursed right. Right? Right. because you just won't be able to right. do that right? right we should look at that you know what you know we should look at we should look at because it, it's always been a setup. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a setup, and so we should examine that and see what are we capable of doing. Because uh, right. I don't know if the law prevents us from doing something different. We Correct. may have to lean into our state senate and our city council, but the way it's set up, it has always been set up for other for the bigger. The it's bigger not set outfits, up for yeah. this. Yeah. So uh, we're going to look at it have our legal team look at it and say, Eric, this is what you have to change in the city council, or this is, this is what you have to change in the state, so it could be more yeah. friendly to our style of what's done. It has never been friendly to it. Oh, it was no. always a broken system. You spend your money first, and then we reimburse you, and then we're going to wait a whole year to reimburse you, then you're going to say, you know what, I'm not even doing this anymore. Right. So we got to look at that. That's our commitment to look at it. But we, like my grandmother used to say, the big Expensive broom may sweep better, but he can't get into the corner. Right? <laughs> he can't get into the corner to get that dirt out that's in the corner, right? You can get into the corner. Right, right. And you know what we could do, probably, Sheena, on the short term? Mm -hmm. A lot of our corporate entities yep. are asking how could they help. They help yep. So if they put aside, you know, a, you know, a couple of million dollars mm -hmm. to tie you over and you just pay back a, a no no interest loan, you pay back, you know, so you don't have to try to raise the money first. So let it, we're really, we're zeroing in on this. So we're going to find ways to do so. And I also want to, we have been speaking with a lot of our corporate entities. We should set up a conversation with sitting down with the partnership and all of our big corporations, uh, Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs, they have been blowing our phone up saying, how do we help? Right. So we should get you in a room with them, do a presentation of what you're doing. Uh, and so that they can see, because I've been talking about you in every corporate boardroom that I'm in. And so we should set up yep. mm -hmm. to get them, bring some of these corporate leaders mm -hmm. and come on the ground with you. Come here. Yeah. Uh, but one last thing is regarding the, uh, the monies for, for um, intervention, what you do, right? There's money in the Build Back Better program, mm -hmm. like $5 billion for exactly what you do. But that's caught up in the politics of uh, Washington right now, right? And we passed it out of the House, but the Senate is like... So we got to figure out a way or how do we get that money, and maybe even through some of the private sector folks, right? right, right. So that you have access to dollars to, to do the work that you do. You know what I mean? It's as simple as that. You can't wait for the politics to sort of like work itself out because... Right, right. You know, there's a dynamic there that, you know, it's going very on difficult. Now. But right. we understand, you know, I, I was in East Harlem with Senator Schumer, with the groups over there that do the same thing you do. And, and there's money there for that, right? And they had the, those mobile units. I don't know if you have them here that come into the block. I and mean, just like you said, they could pinpoint to like the zip code where they've been at and, and to see how crime has gone, violent crime has gone down there. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, but we need to get you access to those dollars. And right now, that money that was assigned there is caught up in politics. So right. we got to figure out, you know, how we do that. I agree. That. I agree. I'm going to take one or two more. Uh, Can I just piggyback Hello. off what oh. Sister was talking about regarding the school that you just you mentioned, Mr. Mayor, about prevention? And I think if we can start, Kwame and I just did something recently with the elementary school level. It was actually on the day, and I, and I know most of us talk about the middle schools and the high schools, but I think if we can plant that seed to those third and fourth graders, mm. Kwame and I was doing an assembly, matter of fact, uh, with some more community leaders on the day the 13-year-old got <laughs> shot in the neck in the Bronx mm. uh, a few weeks ago. And just that kind of made an impact, and I believe just planting that seed is able to make a change in those young folks, their thinking, you know, because a lot of them, matter of fact, we had asked them questions about, you know, how many have, have seen violence, and you'd be surprised that everybody's hand went up. You know, I'm, talk I'm talking about in, in PS 121, that's over there in, uh, on Allerton Avenue, and you'd be surprised at the, the little ones, the second, third, fourth graders, and I believe I've always been a, as I guess maybe it's the pastor in me, but I've always been a firm believer that if we can reach them when they're young, that, you know, that can be a preventive measure also. Well said. Yes. Hello, everyone. I just want to thank you for having this meeting. Thank you, Vanessa Gibson, all the council members, um, Jessica Bofield, everyone. So my name is James Dobbins. I work at Lincoln Hospital. It's the busiest trauma center in New York City. Um, my job is to track all the gunshots, assaults, and stabbings. We have three components. You know, the intervention, we have so many gunshots, assaults, and stabbings. We work with SOS, we do liaisons. They come in, they sit with the patients. Um, you know, just to stop retaliation, we have a strong relationship with our community partners, SOS. And we have our internal hospital responders with victim crime services. The caskets we have to pick out for these people, there's family support groups mm. with RTG and Pastor Henry. And we have our family support group. So gun down, I thought we work very well with the crisis management care violence system. And we have our credible messages on the ground also. Um, the prevention component, you know, the gun is not fun in schools from pre-K to five years old, putting in the people's psyche in the schools. You know, we're going to the schools right now. I echo everyone what they're saying as far as being present in the schools, we're in the schools. I think that's part of the solutions. I just want to get straight to the solutions right now. You know, our goal is to have credible messengers. You know, we talk to Bragg, we talk to all the, Christ, you know, we talk to all the teams, to have ambassadors and representatives in all the NYCHA houses. We have to have a strong presence out there. You know, we have to have more feet, more boots on the ground, and we have ambassadors, which the mayor office is supporting. We're able to hire more people and put them on the ground and expand the model throughout all the NYCHA houses. That's one of the things I really believe that needs to be done actively as far as now solutions, as far as more boots on the ground. Um, we also identified a safe haven, a space where we could talk more in depth, you know, because a lot of problems, some people can't come to Lincoln. Some people can't go to SOS. They can't go to Bragg because of the beef. And we have our hands, hands on on the pulse of some of the shootings. We have court mandates. We get referrals from the 40th precinct, the 41st precinct, from the local community members. They refer youth to us. We have our summer youth program. We believe in engaging the youth. The public hospital is so unique. You know, could we take kids from the Bronx? When I take them to Long Island, they in awe with just the grass. They're showing the diversity. You know, being able to go to all 11 acute hospitals and 75 annexes, utilize the New York City Health and Hospital platform. We are housed in New York City Health and Hospital. This model should be replicated. We have people getting shot in all the hospitals throughout New York City. And we have an office here at Lincoln Hospital. I believe we should have it replicated throughout all the New York City hospitals. Because we have the platform there. So we have a lot of ideas. And I just wanted to say thank you for this meeting. And we're here to work with... <coughs> With everyone here, with the uh, NYPD, all the crime violence you know, system, CMS, and we just need to get more boots on the ground. And, 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 and when I met you in the Bronx, you were, you were sharing what you were doing, and when I got home that night, I put your name and information mm -hmm. in my journal so we could come back. Yes. And uh, I love the idea of replicating what you're doing in all the H&H. &H. Those are our hospitals, yeah. you know. So, Sheena, we should, we should see about setting up a time where you could do a presentation with the team and how do we replicate that in all of our H&H because &H, you're right, you know, when folks get in these beef, that's a great place to deal with retaliatory action. Uh, what we must do is that uh, we must be uh, your backup and support. We must make sure all of our agencies 
are tied into what you're doing. So when you walk into an, a hospital that to stop the retaliatory shooting, they need to be welcoming you. You should not be alienated. If you reach out to the police and say, listen, something's about to jump off, they should not be trying to disrespect you. They should be finding out how do we help. So we want to make sure our city agencies are doing the job. We're going to have a workforce development plan. So you're in the street and someone is saying, man, you're trying to tell me to get off this corner. I need a job. You should be able to point them to our workforce development and get them a job. So I, what I want you to see that, you know, this is like, you know, this is an ET moment. You're no longer alone, man. We're in this together. Right. The, the services of this city, they're your services. And we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page, that you're the, you are Marines on the ground. You need the resources to do the job. And that is what we're going to acclimate our city agencies to understand. We could take uh, one more thing, we, then I got to bounce. Um, <laughs> I work with RTG, and I just think, you know, I live in the area that I work. I live two blocks from my office. And um, I just think it's the best way to help with the gang violence and stuff is to deal with the leaders of the, of the gangs. Because if you have a faucet running, that water is going to keep running until you turn the knob to stop it from running. So if it's a way to work with the gang leaders and make them allies, because at some point, you know, you got to do different things. At some point, you got to make your enemies an ally to get past the, uh, the violence that we're trying to get through, you know. So maybe a change from punishment to working with some of these leaders of the gangs and stuff can help because even if you have a young kid in school, the young kid is going to look up to the older kids. And if the older kids is looking up to the gang leaders, then that's going to form a line that's just going to keep going. So at some point, you know, we should try to work with these gang leaders to try to stem the violence because if the gang members are only listening to them, the only way to stop it will be to work with them. Okay. I just wanted to add another point, and I think many of you already are aware, through the crisis management system, we've been able to forge more partnerships with the Department of Ed, where many of you have a physical presence in some of our middle schools. Chancellor David Banks often says this, and I agree with him, and I've said it as well. You know, the issue is not what's happening inside our schools. It's the path that young people have to take to get to school that is the problem being in the same neighborhoods where it's not safe. And that is attributed to why so many young people feel the urgent need to bring a weapon to school. It's because they're dealing with something in the neighborhood or potentially at home. And so as we talk about your specific catchment area and expanding, I also wanna make sure we talk about expanding our footprint in schools. I would argue that it's even more important to start, as Pastor G has said, at the elementary school level because we know sometimes it's further exacerbated by the time you get to middle school. So elementary school is the way that we should go to work with so many of our young people, work with the educators. A lot of our schools are now community schools, so there is a not-for-profit partner physically in that school. But whatever it is that we should be doing, it's really about that network on the school piece. Because sometimes I get really upset when some people think that the only answer to addressing violence in schools is the deployment of school safety agents. And I support our SSAs, and I know many of them. They are a part of the solution, but they're not the only solution. If you have a presence in our schools with therapeutic services and wraparound services, and a lot of what we say is their social emotional learning, healing centers, that is a part of your work too. So I wanted to make sure that that's a part of our conversation because expanding your footprint in our public schools is a part of keeping our children safe as well. Okay, we, we, just, we, we, okay. we go ahead, sister, can you I get just, a chance to talk? I'm not gonna be too long because I thank you guys for being here and I send my love to the Bronx. My team was up here yesterday and we just, my heart goes out to you. But I wanna say something. I enjoy being in your presence all the time because you get it. You understand and you know the communication between the leaders of the organizations and our city agencies is what we need. Yes. That is yes. going to be the difference in making this change. Yes. When I'm a lot, when 
NYPD commanding officers are calling my phones on the weekends, I welcome it because they know the blocks that they have to watch. They know where they're at. They are a step ahead, right? So if you can call me and I can pull up my team and my team can be there, it works. That's right. It's preventative. It, we don't have to always react after the fact, right? I want to talk about the mobile units. The mobile units are important. I don't want my violence interrupters and the outreach workers in their cars. I need them in my units because NYPD identifies with my units. Department of Sanitation identifies with my units, right? So it's important when we talk about the red tape that we understand if as crisis management organizations, if we're expected to have the results and we want to see the gun violence and the crime decrease in our communities, we have to be equipped with the resources, right? I can shut down blocks from selling drugs and, and, and having illegal activity, but what precision employment program am I sending them to? Right, right. right. How long right. is it going to take for me to get a referral for OSHA? That's right. Right. Yeah. When we got all these buildings and construction sites coming up every day in our communities. Right. I need those guys on those construction sites. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to have to go through eight different agencies and referrals to make that happen. Right. So there's a lot that we can do together as leaders of organizations because we know it. But if we don't have the tools and the resources and we don't keep the communication going, we won't we won't be able to have the results that we're looking for, you know? So I don't have to keep going on and on because you said it. You said <laughs> all of the agencies and the leaders are gonna come together and continue to have conversations. I'm on sanitation every week. Listen, pick up the garbage in my hot spots right, because right, garbage right. allows for stash spots, right, right? right? Garbage allows for you to put guns in garbage. Right. So if I don't want people to have access to these guns, I need this garbage in my community cleared up. And I shouldn't have to wait on the 1-800 line for 45 minutes That's to get right, garbage out, right, right, right? right? So we need all of the organizations, all of its leaders, right? Mm -hmm. We need all of the NYPD commanding officers. We need us to go through these catchment areas together. Are we even at the right spots? Right. Right. right we right. need to make sure that we have the right information and that we're equipped with the right tools mm -hmm. to be able to do this. And on the city council level, Vanessa, I love you. I appreciate everything you've done for CMS. But it's so important for our city council representatives to understand that it's the small mentorship funding that allows us to get in the school for the principal to be able to see our work, right? So when I come in, I'm not coming in as a stranger from CMS. I'm coming in as the organization that provides educational programming to your young people. So the relationships are already built. But if we don't have our city council representatives supporting our work, the way that they can, then we don't have our state representatives like Zelen or Myrie supporting our work the way they can, then it takes years for these relationships right, to get built. Right. right. Right? And if organizations are putting in the work and we're out there and we're doing the right thing, it shouldn't take years for the resources to catch up to us. Right. Well so said. it's important. Well Thank well you. Said. Well said. And so uh, let, me, let me tell you this because I was listening to you. Um, so what we're going to do, Sheena, we're going to every agency in the city is going to have a crisis management liaison, mm -hmm. D Department of Sanitation, NYPD, HPD, HR, HRA, DOE. You, instead of you navigating the bureaucracy of an agency, every agency is going to have, when you pick up the phone, you're going to be calling someone. Let them navigate the bureaucracy. And you're going to, we're going to set up a meeting part of the crisis management team that we're going to do citywide we're going to have on the zoom if we do a zoom if we're able to do it in person we do it in person we're going to have every commissioner that intersects with what you're doing because the average person would not even realize that department of sanitation plays a role and so we're going to have those commissioners on 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 the zoom they're going to see you you're going to talk to them you probably don't even you probably haven't even sat down with any of the commissioners outside the office to, office to combat gun violence so we can't say this is a holistic problem when you don't even know who the players are mm -hmm. listen if you don't walk away from anything in this table walk away with this your power is mm -hmm. in the agencies mm -hmm. the relationship is you pay your taxes agencies provide goods and services if you don't have access to those goods and services then you're not empowered if we open and unlock agencies to you you're going to see a different game that's the power. Yep. The power is in the agencies. Yep. 
all of these agencies from PD to DOE to FDNY uh, to Department of Sanitation to HPD, all of these agencies, DOT, you may just have, you, you want to close down the street to do a block party or anti-violence, and then you got to navigate PD, you got to navigate DOT, you got to navigate, navigate uh, the organizations that put together the block permit. Man, that's over. <laughs> that's over. Those games are over. You, you reach out and say, we need to close down this block. That block is getting closed down. You know, because you're on the ground. Yeah. We're not playing this game anymore where agencies are running the city. Mm. No, no. Agencies are going to respond to what I need done to empower you to do your job. That's where we're going. That's the Adams era. I don't know what's going to happen after, <laughs> but I know what's going to happen now. We got, we got, we got, we got, we got to go. I got, I'm going to go visit this, this officer. Yes. Mm. How you doing? And thank you for having us. Thank you, brother. Cool. I just want question, and I just need your support. And my condolences go out to the officer that got thank you doing his line of work. Um, I just need the officers to continue to let us do our work when we're dealing with the high risk out there, because it is difficult and we don't get that support on the 40th and 42nd precinct all the time. Because one of my participants got tased when I was trying to talk to the officer to let me talk to the participant. So we're going to need that assistance to be able to do that work because it's going to get hard. There's a lot of violence in the Bronx. So please talk to the officers when they see us out there engage us. Try to let us do that work. We know that when to stand down, if it's a killing going down or the participants got guns or whatever, we'll stand down. But most of the time, we need that assistance so we can do our work so they can respect us a little more and we can make those changes. Without a doubt, brother. And I haven't heard this from, only from you. I heard it from others. And we're going to create a new synergy. You know, you, you both have two different ways of doing your job. You're not going to be able to do your job successfully if people believe you're an extension of the police department. You know, you, you're separate entities, but you have a common denominator. And the more that we communicate, you're going to be able to do, they, do, do your job. And that's just so important. And I hear it far too often that, you know, that relationship is not right. When you come on the scene, that inspector should be happy to see you. I have some inspectors, uh, some captains. Uh, that are doing it right. They understand, hey, these guys are holding it down for me. I don't have to deal with it. And there's others that are not doing it right, and we're going to improve on that. And you know how you improve on it the most? We're gauging promotions based on your ability to interact with your crisis management team. And my crisis management teams are saying, listen, this cat is not flowing with us, and we can't get anything done. Then listen, why am I going to keep moving you up through the rank and file? It's about how well you create relationships. And every um, uh, uh, community officer, you need to know all your crisis management team members. Mm -hmm. That's the relationship we are building. We're going to build a relationship where the team is rowing in the same direction. We're all rowing in different directions. Got to row in one direction to save our city, the streets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.